So welcome back to our second podcast for Focal Press. I'm Mike Testa, and today we are interviewing uh, Alex Case. Hey, Mike. Author of the new book, Effects. Is this your first book? It's not the first book I've read. No. But it is the first book I've written, yes. So I've written uh, probably more than 100 articles over the years uh, in, the, in the professional press related to recording. Uh, but this is, yes, this is the first book. And what publications have the articles been in? Uh, I've been published mainly in recording magazines. Oh, awesome. Mainly a monthly column that went on and on. I believe one of them was called Nuts and Bolts. Yes, that was the monthly column that went for more than a couple of years. Really? And and that that was some of the first writing that uh, found its way into this book. While this book is a massive rewrite of that content, uh, a lot of those monthly episodes uh, get elaborated on in this book. So what was your motivation for this book? Well, probably the main motivation is that... Uh, I, the content of the book, Sound Effects, really reflects the stuff I've been thinking about most, the stuff I care about the most. And I think there's a lot of a lot of literature out there for all of us in audio who are lifelong learners, always trying to learn more about technologies and more about our craft and all that. There's a lot out there that explains the difference between a ribbon microphone and a condenser microphone. There's stuff out there on MIDI. There's stuff out there on all the other things. But when you get to the content on the sound effects devices, there might just be a paragraph or two. You know, It says what an equalizer does, and then it just lists the knobs. And I always, my whole career, when I was a student in audio and uh, as an experienced recording engineer, I've always been frustrated by that. Uh, so I just, I, I know there's so much more to effects devices than listing the controls that are there. I think that, uh, I think that Jimi Hendrix didn't achieve Little Wing by being told a guitar is six strings and they're tuned to E, A, D, G, B, E, and they're 22 frets and they're half a step apart. You don't create art from that. And so I think inventorying the controls on the effects devices is falls way short of what they're capable of. Right. So I really... I set out to figure out how to make more expressive, more musical use of the, of the device. Now, one of the uh, one of the topics you cover in your book, which you're, you're now famous for, uh, is compression. And you give this talk all over the world now. Where did you come up with this idea of compression the way you explain it? Yeah, well, so this is a little bit too morbid, but, you know, tragic things are memorable in our lives. And so... I was just a kid, but I remember where I was on December 8th, 1980, when I found out some moron shot John Lennon. And while it's much less important than that, I also remember where I was when I was told of the existence of a compressor, this device that automatically turns down gain so the engineer doesn't have to. And I remember just reacting to that in a really negative way. I don't need that device. What is that device for? And then phase two of my learning of, of compression was I started to hear people, much more experienced recording engineers, talking about it in this strange, almost culty way where they were speaking of the magic of the compressor. And so I was just motivated to figure out what is this device for? Wh what is it really used for? Because its nominal application seems so boring. And why do people get so interested in it? Um, and then there was this other issue of it's difficult to hear. And so people would talk about stuff. Yeah, do you hear that? Yeah, I hear that. I can't believe that. And I didn't hear it at first. And so I really it was sort of all counterphobic. I went out to learn about this thing that people seemed to think was so important that I thought wasn't important. Uh, and that's just been something I've done for more than a decade. It's a pet peeve of mine at first, and now it's a pet project of mine. I'm very interested in compression. So the motivation comes from that sort of crazy experience. So where were you when you first learned about a compressor? I remember exactly where I was. I was in a studio classroom at the Berkeley College of Music. I was an undergraduate there. And Ivan Sever, in a class called Mix One, uh, introduced me to the whole idea of the device of compression. And while I was happy to buy into the earlier lectures on EQ and reverb and delay, when I find out, found out about compression, I had no idea those devices existed, and I just immediately became skeptical. What is this device for? Why is it so important? Why are people so passionate about it? It's, it sounds like it does nothing that I need. And so that sort of began my love-hate relationship with compression. And I've set out ever since to sort of try to figure out how to, how to use it for, for good, not for evil. You've been a staff engineer. You've been assistant staff engineer. You've, you've worked in big recording houses all your life. Where did you first realize that really using a compressor to do something more than just gain leveling or peaks limiting, where did you really figure out that man, there's something else here, and I need to really explore this. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I've had the pleasure of assisting, and this is where a lot of learning happens for all of us. I've had the pleasure of assisting some really great engineers, from Ben Wish to Lou Giordano 
to Steve Lillywhite, and and the one that comes to mind on this question is, of course, Tom Lord Algae. Uh, I I had fun assisting Tom Lord Algae back in the mid '90s on the Dave Matthews Band Crash, and he, among a short list of other people, is is famous for having this incredibly effective, aggressive style when he plays the mixing console and his use of effects of all effects, EQ, compression, distortion, his use of automation, all those things uh, always serves the music. He really works hard to make sure that he can create the best loudspeaker performance he can with the tracks he's given. And in particular with compression, he was doing things that uh, at the time I didn't understand how it worked. We certainly weren't talking about how it works, uh, but I was just sort of, I had the opportunity opportunity to hear those tracks before he attacked them and those tracks after he polished them and sort of just went back thinking about it later, listening carefully later, uh, and tried to figure out what he was doing with compression and with other effects. And the main insight, I think, there is that that a single device, the compressor, isn't used for one thing. I think it frustrates students at first, those of us early in our audio careers. We think a compressor is for something, and it's not for one thing. There are really a dozen or more different outcomes from a compressor. Sometimes we compress to add distortion. Sometimes we compress to make the signal last longer. Sometimes we compress to dull the sound. Sometimes we compress to sharpen the sound. So, you know, I, I, I am frustrated when I hear students understandably say, well, I'm, I know I'm supposed to compress the snare, so I'll compress the snare. That, that's no place to start. I want them to have a motivation. I think the snare needs to have sharper attack, so I'll compress the snare. I've been through your classes before and with a lot of... I'm sorry uh, to hear that. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> a lot of students, and I've, I've, I must admit in my early days I was a uh, victim of this, but I would throw on the random compressor two or compressor one in Pro Tools yeah. and say, I compress the snare when I really had no idea what the hell I was doing. Yeah, I've, I've seen very experienced engineers. So while I'm an educator and I hang out with undergrads and grads all the time, I also, when I was a staff engineer, I would see experienced engineers come into the studio and literally take out a book of settings that I think they saw other engineers use and dial up a compressor to a setting and then patch it in on a snare drum or a vocal. And that just makes no sense. Right. It, it, you, you have to have a strategy in mind before you even begin to compress. And there's no reason to think one setting will transfer to any other track. Uh, so I think, I think that's a common misunderstanding that it makes more sense to say, hey, a condenser mic makes sense on acoustic guitar. That's true a lot of the times, but but we can't be so literal and repetitive in our in our use of EQ, compression, reverb. I think I think it's a much more it's much more about the art. It's like asking someone, well, what chord should come after this one? That, that's a very non-linear question. It's not fair to really ask it. But I think that's the kind of problem solving we do when we patch in a, an effects device. Chapter six of Alex Case's book, Sound FX, devotes nearly 40 pages to compression with 14 figures and a discography of important examples of compression in pop and rock recordings. It's a great place to learn everything there is to know about compressors, how they work, what to listen for, how to select the right compressor for the job, and how to tweak them into the sound effect you want to hear. For more information, go to www.vocalpress.com.